As my deep domain expertise has digitally disseminated, it's provided immense opportunities to connect with like-minded individuals across the entire health and wellness CBG ecosystem. And that includes the investment in financial services layer, which shouldn't be surprising to regular audience members as my content has always been heavy handed in that general area. So with the emerging and intersecting categories of functional foods, functional beverages, and dietary supplements becoming increasingly more attractive deal-making targets by the day, it seemed like a great time to bring on my good friend, Teddy Townsend, who's a consumer health and wellness sector expert and director of investment banking at CG Sawaya Partners. As you'll notice, even in a relatively short amount of time, Teddy and I were able to deeply cover a lot of ground in this content piece from a rundown on investment banking engagement basics to possible landmines that can wreck deals and the importance of build model strategic optionality. We also examine what factors are driving categorical deal making from the perspective of private equity and strategic acquirers. Moreover, Teddy and I expand our insights to cover the reasoning behind strategic acquirers shifting away from broad-based to need state-specific M&A of VMS companies. Finally, we both share a few consumer health and wellness spaces that could be hotbeds for deals soon. But these are just some of the fascinating topics we chatted about in this episode. So without further delay, here is the recent conversation I had with Teddy Townsend. I'm thinking this is a long time coming. You know, I'm not good with dates anymore, I think post uh, dad uh, brain, but I figure it was August or so when like the Thorn uh, deal and El Catterton deal came out. And some of your, I think health, health and wellness team members like reached out because I did some like independent analysis on the deal. And, and I think maybe I said a smart thing or two in there. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but. Uh, I think you it, did. I think yeah. you caught the attention of uh, Mr. Fouad Suwaya, which is how, uh, how you got the inbound from us. Yeah, I get lucky sometimes. I say, you know, a, a few things. I always use the, the uh, term like, you know, blind squirrel finds a nut every once in a while. And, and that was one of them. And I was lucky, <laughs> lucky enough to do it. And I, and I'm not sure like if I had caught any of the other deals, I know you guys have done at least, I was trying to count like two dozen deals or so since like 2020. And a lot of them are in my space or at least adjacent to it enough that like I pay attention to it, but maybe I just didn't break it down into some content, but you know, enough about all that. But Teddy, I want to thank you for the time that you're giving me today. And, and I'm excited about our conversation. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I'm glad we uh, we finally get to do this. So let's talk consumer wellness trends. And I think we're going to start first a little bit around like, like personally, I know there's, you know, the professionally things that you're always paying attention to. But I know that also this is not necessarily just a, a work thing. Like you are also into health and wellness and paying attention to things like personally, have any of these trends like really caught your eye? Like, are you in the depths of any of these? Are you you know, hitting up the cold plunges and posting it on Instagram each day to show every single person how much pain you're putting yourself through? I don't quite, I'm not quite at that level yet, but um, <laughs> I am uh, jokingly called the consumer's consumer in my office because I will, I will try anything. Um, and I usually have like a, a full suite at my apartment of different products, half of which are unopened. And so anytime I throw parties usually people leave with party favors of like supplements and things like that um because i love i love the space and i think it's consistently evolving and you know there's been different trends over the last call it five to ten years of different ways people have approached things and um so personally you know i probably three years ago i was noticing i was super fatigued i was like emotional which was very out of character um I didn't have great energy. I was like, I, I was sort of gaining some weight. I didn't really know what was going on. And I ended up going uh, to the well in New York City, which was one of these kind of upstart wellness groups, um, hence the name. And I had a full blood panel run on myself, um, which I had never had, you know, I, I have doctors who do kind of standard blood panels on like cholesterol and things, but this was like full blood panel. Um, and it turned out I was allergic to gluten, like highly sensitive to gluten, highly sensitive to dairy, highly sensitive to alcohol, like wines, especially, um, and not like, you know, wine and I had different reactions to all of these things. And then I also found out about all these deficiencies, but it totally changed the way that I approached wellness. And I, I think a lot of consumers are sort of having this evolution of going from just taking a multivitamin to 
doing some of like the personalization things like a care of where it wasn't really personalized. It was just like a bunch of vitamins that you didn't really know in a bag to, okay, I really want to understand like my system, what is driving my overall wellness and what are the specific product, not necessarily brands, but like products that I should be taking. So for me, like there was a list, like I had to get a good probiotic. I had to really avoid certain foods. And then how do you sort of like modify your supplement intake to offset the the loss of certain I mean but it's transformational like within a month I was sleeping through the night I like lost 10 pounds without doing anything um and so I think more and more like that's the consumer conversation it's like what are efficacious products I want things that are targeted towards me it doesn't mean it's a personalized product it means it's a choice that's very symptom specific for me um so I do the sauna. I haven't graduated to the cold plunge. I'm not yet willing to subject myself to that, but um, I do go to the sauna two or three times a week, which I love. Right now, I, I sort of went through a phase where I was taking a bunch of different supplements, and I eventually got tired of taking a million pills a day. Um, and so now I'm sort of more into the liposomal form factor, which hmm. I love. Um, it feels much more user-friendly. There's real science behind the kind of the, the delivery. Not all of them are as good as, you know, some. But um, so I'm kind of mixing and matching right now. But my routine is much more, it's much more part of my day as opposed to what it had been, which was like almost like you felt like it was a duty to take 15 pills. And I don't, I just don't think consumers are really interested in that anymore. And certainly I'm not. So, um, so I don't know if that helps, but that's my, my personal journey. And, uh, so I'm constantly exploring. I, like I said, I will try almost anything. Um, there's always a bunch of brands in my kind of arsenal that I'm testing out. So I like to think I've made progress. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely think we're probably aligned in that. Like, I think I went through a similar journey. I think maybe about 2017, I was kind of feeling the same way where I, for years, I had kind of fought the idea that, you know, I was just, I uh, needed to work harder. I needed to do these things. You know, you kind of try to push or, or find little hacks to get around this, that, or wherever. And you just realize eventually, like, there's something that's just off. Something doesn't right. feel right. And then you go to the doctor and, you know, they run a million panels on you and you figure out all these different things and you're like, oh, okay, there's some things that are going on that I need to correct. And right. that was where similarly I kind of went through that journey. And, you know, I think I'm excited to kind of get back to that because I think during anybody I, people know this at this point, but like I had, you know, baby four or five months ago and like everything goes to <laughs> zero. I feel like I mean there's probably some like fitness influencers or wellness influencers are like, you gotta stick with it. But I'm like, reality That's is hard. is like you're putting all your time and effort into this this new little thing. And uh, yeah. And like, you know, those things fall to the wayside. So they're not as the priority as that. But you know, getting back to that now that you're in a swing of things. So I would agree. I mean, I'm you know lucky enough that I get sent tons of different things and I have a lot of different friends that are involved with different aspects of the health and wellness space that you kind of get access to to different things. So I'll try everything, but I, I will say that I'm definitely not as um, advanced. I, you know, there's that kind of jokingly term that's used out there, like the Huberman husband. Like I'm definitely not that person where like I'm doing every little like yeah. uh, neuroscience hack or, or whatever that is. I found things that work well for me and I stick with that. And maybe that also is aligned with like some of the things that I'm most passionate with, like categories or subcategories right. or, or whatever that is. But I do agree. I think there's you know, a lot of where this moves from is like, there's the product side of things, which is great. It has to be, um, you know, arguably, you know, perfect, or, you know, at least in the top, whatever, 5% of the category. And then there's, what are you building off of that? You know, is there, you know, some type of biomonitoring, um, you know, some type of personalization, yeah. some type of like, you know, utilizing even like generative AI to provide recommendations and like all those things provide the consumer the ability to get a better sense of like what they need to accomplish their specific goals, or at least closer to that N1 situation where they understand like those things over, like you said, just taking a basic pack of vitamins and saying, I hope this works. Like, I don't know, but this Fingers seems crossed. like, 
you know, think everybody seems to be enjoying these as well. So let me try them out. Like, I think that's definitely not going to be where we continue to go. I think, you know, generally we're moving in a direction where people are going to be more data informed about the decisions they're making. Yeah. But, you know, there's still a lot of, I think, hurdles to get us to that point and a lot of maybe false promises that are starting to show their faces. You mentioned, you know, kind of one, and, and there's a number of ones that are kind of similar to that, that seem to be like, they were great for what they were, but they weren't exactly the promise that we were hoping them to yeah. be. And, and, you know, maybe again, it's a step in the right direction. And now we're, you know, moving on to something bigger. Yeah. Well, and also I think there's like a realization and I certainly went through this of like, you have to approach this from a holistic perspective. So like I, I mean, I've been in banking for 13 years, like the banking hours are not ideal. You tend to eat terrible food and you don't sleep well and whatever. And, you, you know, so I always thought of like supplements as truly like a supplement to offset all of the terrible decisions I made. And I, I think where I am coming from now and where I find a lot of people are like consumers is you have to approach wellness much more holistically. It's everything you do, whether it's like a cold plunge, you know, we're seeing it with things like red light therapy, you know, cropping up all over the place, um, as well as the ingestibles, whether it's the supplements, the functional nutrition, or just kind of the diet that you're eating. Um, and how do you think about food? How do you think about protein intake? Like, so I, that's another thing I've seen is it's a much more like holistic lens of wellness as opposed to just being limited to like, how do I offset my bad choices with like a vitamin, which as you know, you unfortunately can't do. I mean, it'd be a big seller if you could, but um, so that has been the other shift I've seen. But like, I mean, you know, we did this, I don't know if you saw it, but we did this um, webinar with McKinsey probably like seven or eight months ago on consumer health. And like, some of the statistics they had were wild. I mean, it's sort of intuitive, but it, it lines up with what you and I are talking about. I mean, they they said like 82% of consumers are listing health and wellness as a top priority. And over 50% of them are saying that's increased over the last year. So it's it's massive in terms of people just like thinking about it. Um, now, whether or not they're doing anything about it is a different story, but there's clearly like a push on the consumer side to figure out wellness, to get better products into their system, to feel better, to address aging, you know, whatever it is. I may be unique in terms of my like interest in trying everything, but I do think there's a general push towards towards wellness across the board. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And I think that that even kind of moves into, you mentioned, you know, investment banking. And, and I think that, you know, if it's deal interest, if it's, you know, people building in the space, all these types of things, like it is an exciting, I think, dynamic, interesting area that, like you mentioned before, it's it's constantly evolving. It seems like every handful of years it washes itself and like something new kind of comes out. And thinking about my audience and like who watches a lot of this, and, and it is a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs, brands, startups. And I'm thinking about, you know, hey, I, I found arguably some product market fit. I've you know, started to do some interesting things. I'm getting up to a level that I, I feel like maybe I should get some attention towards some potential, you know, either major strategic investors or, you know, some potential buyer. And then I'm like, okay, where do I go? And, and what do I do? And, and they're arguably going to turn to, you know, somebody like yourself. And I was wondering if maybe you can, you know, maybe talk through some of the kind of engagement basics or just kind of the stuff that you work with and kind of set up and make sure that everything is kind of going because, you know, I'm usually on a, a different side of this, you know, engagement where I'm working, usually are in the phase where they are, you know, getting that growth and, and trying to get themselves positioned. And I always get the question more from the standpoint of, you know, should I be building for some targeted deal path or should I build with like strategic optionality? And I always tend to go towards the optionality part. And that's mostly because I think it just, you know, something weird happens like the last couple of years or whatever that is, like you do have the ability to kind of, I don't want to say pivot, but at least you have options out there to move right. around and stay alive and then ultimately come up with maybe a better solution than, than you originally thought of over going, you know, let me put all my ducks in a row and go for it because, you know, again, I'm on that side of the business as well, where sometimes people do put all their ducks in a row in one direction, and then it doesn't work out if it's timing or they don't get the right uh, interest or whatever it is. And then you have to come in and basically, you know, 
retrench the business for a couple of years and then restart because they put themselves in such a weird position in the market. Right. I mean, so I spend about 50% of my time on the minority raise side. So raising, call it 40, $50 million plus rounds. And then the other 50% is on the exit. So I am in a little bit of the unique position is I, like, I'll talk to brands that are doing a million in, of sales. Like I will, I, I think it's really important to continue to build those dialogues. So I end up speaking to people very, very early in their journey. Sometimes they haven't even raised money. My view, especially in light of what we've seen in the last year, and I can like get into kind of how the, the world has shifted, is before you take a dime from anybody, you should know what your goals are. If your goal is to run your business forever, you probably don't want to take venture money because they have a horizon, they expect an exit. Um, and if you are going to take venture money and you do know you want an exit, Make sure that your timelines align, make sure that your visions align, make sure that the valuation they're coming in at makes sense. Because I agree with you. The biggest thing we have seen is that people assume the stars will align when they go to sell their business. And it almost never happens. Um, there's this myth that in every great process, there's like 10 strategics. But the fact of the matter is usually there's only one or two. Two, if you're like lucky. And that applies to even the best assets that have been sold. You know, it's it's not as if there's five people lined up. So if you, you know, as you're as you're starting out and you're thinking, okay, this is my dream, I have a vision, I have a great product, you know, presumably you think it's a great product. That remains to be seen, but assume it's a great product. Um, and you know, and I think this can be X and I am gonna need 10 million of funding to commercialize this, whatever it is. Really, you know, people in 2019 through like 2020, they saw these valuations and they ran with it and they accepted structures they shouldn't have accepted. They accepted valuations that were completely arbitrary and had nothing to do with the real value of the business. And the problem with that is in two to three, four years, when you go to sell, you may no longer be aligned with your investors because they may have some completely arbitrary threshold that they need to clear for you to make any money. And that may not be realistic because again, at the end of the day, like the strategics may not be there, in which case you're talking to private equity groups um, and they are very much financial animals. So, you know, I, and I, and I think that's the other part of it is there's like the fundraising position, which is like, okay, make sure your cap table makes sense from day one. Cause that, can trip you up later for really no real reason. There's also the like, how do I build a business? And I remember when I first started talking to early stage companies, they would ask like growth or profitability. And every single person in the space was like growth, 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 growth is all the like lose 50 million to grow 100 million. Great. Like that's totally fine. And it always was like so perplexing to me because I was like, yeah, but these people are like, they're making real products. It's not a tech business where it just like converts one day. And so that has shifted. And now it's, it's, it's more like, I, I think about it as, do you have sustainable growth? I.e. like for every dollar you're bringing in, are you spending more than that dollar to bring it in? Like how, how healthy is that cohort you're bringing into your business? And so when I talk to companies, it's, you know, they're like, if I spend all this money, I can grow to be this size. And I'm like, look, if you want to sell in three years, yes, having growth is very important. You have to be growing. I mean, that's, that's critical from a valuation standpoint. But at the end of the day, if XYZ strategic is not there, which in all reality, they may not be, you're going to want to be able to talk to private equity groups. And there's something like two trillion of like, available funds on the private. I mean, it's huge. So to say to like discount that buyer set is totally nonsensical to me. And it goes to your point on optionality, which is you want to be able to talk to them. The only way you're going to get the value you want from them, though, is by having real EBITDA. And so that's really important to me. Even early on with companies, it's like as you map out your path, you don't want your cap table to screw up an exit for you. And you don't want to be in a position where you may be 100 million of sales, but you're losing 5 million. And uh, frankly, the strategics aren't that interested in that either. But you won't be able to sell if they're not. Um, and to your point, then you're like, you know, you're kind of SOL, right? You got to pause your process, go back to the drawing board. And we've seen like four or five businesses in the supplement space, like big, well known brands in the last six months have this happen. They were either not as profitable as they should have been. 
There were no strategics who were interested. And so then they pivoted to private equity and found out they couldn't get the value they wanted. Or there were some that were big, were very profitable, um, but they could get a good value, but not a value that cleared the investor threshold. And so, you know, we're talking about like 500, 600 million dollar deals. Um, and I just find that like such a waste. It's sort of it's like doesn't make sense to me. So those are like those are the key things I talk to people about. And then as far as, you know, when do you start talking to bankers? I mean, look, I love talking to people, so I will talk to anyone whenever they would like to, um, which is maybe not a great use of time. But um, but. You know, I think there are different reasons to talk to a banker. Sometimes companies will reach out to me because they're like, hey, I'm raising a $5 million round. I know this isn't like what you do, but do you know any other investors who I should talk to? Okay, great. Like, I'll make some introductions. Sometimes I'll talk to people about like, what are the key metrics that um, people are looking at? Sometimes I'll get asked about the strategic landscape. Like, let's understand what strategics are looking for. Those are all very informal conversations, but they're just informative for the founders in terms of how to think about their next stage. Usually where someone comes to me and says, okay, I'm ready to hire you, it's because they see themselves transacting in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, usually it's a little bit of a shorter window, although sometimes it's longer. Certainly in today's market, we're seeing that extend like 10 years ago you got a call that you had to pitch in a month if you won the pitch the deal kicked off in a month like that was how quick the now it's like you get to know people a year or two in advance you like ease into it but usually that's where I find people will be like okay I'm starting to think about it let's talk about what what I need to do ahead of a transaction like you know there's a whole host of third party things you can do now ahead of a deal a quality of earnings you can do brand studies um so, you know, that stuff takes time. So we get engaged a little bit earlier. A lot of different things were flying through my brain when you were talking about it, but I'm going <laughs> to, I'm like, I'm like, no, I love that. But it's like, okay, now I want to unpack each one of them and try to, you know, kind of go, go a little it. bit deeper on it. I, I think firstly, because you mentioned a few things around, I want to call them like landmines, but like at the end of the day, like things that could potentially blow up deals. And you mentioned some around... I call them maybe contractual, like things that are maybe investor clauses or contract, like things in there where they need to make certain things. And, and again, then that the deal maybe doesn't make sense or whatever. That could also mean, you know, I do a lot of things in, in food and beverage and, you know, energy drinks and things like that. Like contractual could also mean that you have like some exclusivity clauses with like distributions yeah. and things that could then hurt you if maybe you know, KDP wants to come in and buy it. And they're like, wait a minute, it's going to cost us this amount of money to buy everybody out. And then the deal's not going to make as much sense or, or whatever that is. But I also think since we were talking a lot around supplements earlier is the thing that always perplexes me is the lack of the ownership of intellectual property, mostly around like formulations, if they're powders or just a lot of that kind of stuff, if it's even trademarks, it's like, like it's interesting that those things slip through the cracks a lot of times where people are like, they don't realize they're important until they get to the point where they're ready to like, you know, sell their business or whatever. And then somebody goes like, wait, like you don't own this or you don't own that or, or whatever that is. And, and I guess another one that kind of comes to my, my brain is again, back to the supplements thing. And having those two pesky, I guess, three letter agencies like the FDA and the FTC is like a lot of the, I guess, product claims, substantiation of marketing and all that type of stuff. Like that is to me, I guess, a legal risk or, or whatever it is. It comes down to those are things that at least I've seen over the last 13 years of consulting, even before that, like things that potentially blow up deals because people just didn't realize how important those things are to these you know, say it's strategics or even PE, they just don't want to deal with that kind of stuff. Like that's the stuff that like turns them way off because yeah. it, it seems messier and more difficult than maybe what it is sometimes. And they just go, well, I don't, I don't want to deal with this. Yeah. I mean, look, I'll start with your contractual one. So I think for us, there's a couple of ways the investor, like the early round can impact the future round. There's the structural component of Hey, I'll give you 20 million at a $500 million valuation with a like a three X liquidation breath. So understanding what the implication of that is at exit is really important because like, they're not really, I mean, the 500 million, million valuation is made up, right? They're doing, um, it, they're, that's not how they're thinking about it. Um, so, but understanding, okay, they need to clear 60 million 
Otherwise, I don't make a dime as the founder is a, is a better way to think about that. Yeah, and the numbers can be much more aggressive. I mean, we're talking about in some cases like hundreds of millions of dollars that have that kind of lick prep. So that's like the first thing, because then when you go to sell, say somebody makes you a great offer, say your business is really worth $70 million and that's great. And as a founder, like that's a great outcome. It's no longer a great outcome because you took 20 million and that person is going to get 60 out, out of your deal. Um, so understanding the economic, like it, it's contractual, but it's also the economic implications of that contract. There's also things like rights around, you know, when you can sell, right? Maybe your investors don't want you to sell before three years. So they have a right that anything before three years, you have to get their permission. Okay. So, you know, maybe the business is doing really well and you want to sell and your investors don't want you to sell. There's also situations where they have rights around when you have to sell. So maybe in five years, they have a right that they have the ability to go market your business and hire a banker. So those are more around the timeline of what your goals are. Then there's um, just generally like other contractual things that can come up. Like we were doing a deal and one of the sellers, um, one of the, like the, there was like a, a note or something in there that like nobody was really aware of, but it became something that they were able to hold us hostage with at the end of the deal because they had ownership and they had a right of, they had to accept the sale this was like, we were very far down the path. Um, and it ended up getting resolved, but it was a last minute issue that could have blown up the deal over like a couple million dollars, which was nothing in comparison to what the deal was. But again, it was like this very odd contractual thing that um, the company should have been much more thoughtful about and they weren't. So like really understanding every agreement you make. Um, there's also things like notification requirements, you know, to suppliers, sometimes your suppliers will have approval rights, like they have to, it's a closing condition, they have to approve the deal. So we spend a lot of time going through that, because those are all things that they're not typically things that blow up deals, but they can really throw a wrench in things that you don't need. Then there's the second part of the equation, which is, is you, you touched on, which is like the regulatory, trademark, legal piece. From my vantage point, that stuff is binary. It's not a question of valuation. If you have an issue on the regulatory side and it's material enough to come up during a deal, it will likely be a binary decision. Typically, people are not like, oh, I'll just like knock $10 million off the purchase price for that. So, and we've seen this across the board. We've seen it with strategics who now do five-year lookbacks ahead of a process. So before they ever get a call from a banker, they um, are scouring the internet for every claim you make, for every marketing piece of material, all of that stuff, because the last thing they want is to get sued. So, you know, that didn't exist five years ago, that kind of rigor around claims testing. Um, you know, there are suppliers, and you should sort of expect this from any strategic, the level of review of the ingredient profile, that they will get the ingredients, send it to their R&D, make sure what you say is on the bottle is in the bottle. So like really understand your ingredient profile. Um, to your point about owning formulas and like owning, you know, trademarks, we actually saw a deal blow up because they didn't own the trademark for their number one product, which was like, like mind boggling. Um, but, you know, I think on the formulation side, look, a lot of supplements there, you don't, it's all command. You don't own the formula. Like that's, that's fine. Um, but there is a much more rigorous focus on ingredients, on the science, on the claims you're making. So even if you don't own the actual like formulation, you still, you know, maybe there's something proprietary about it. There should be something kind of that sets you apart. Um, but again, those things can be very much binary, especially if they come out later in the in the in the um, in the deal. Um, I mean, we've received FDA letters in the middle of deals, right, where it's like, hey, you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. We've navigated them, um, but it's not, it's not my favorite thing to do. So like a strong preference for no FDA letters. Um, and then I think the third, the third thing I'll touch on there is the stuff you don't control, which is the strategic landscape, psychology, macroeconomic. So, you know, I think hiring a good advisor who knows this, this is like one of the benefits of bringing someone who's a sector ex expert is that you know, take supplements, for example, and you probably know this just as well as I do, but um, I mean, it's been a disaster. Like the strategic landscape has gone through a massive transformation in the last two years, and it's going to continue to go through one. 
So, you know, you have Unilever basically saying smarty pants didn't work. We're going to take a, like a pause. We need to figure out our next steps. You've got new CEOs across the board in all these businesses. Um, and, and with the new CEOs, you have new kind of business development teams. Plus, you have the big four separations. So you have, you know, Halion went first, huge separation, a lot of debt, had to divest things. They spent all of last year doing that. You know, now they're very focused on growth. M&A is going to be part of that. You've Kenview, who closed their separation end of last year. You've got Sanofi, who said that they are assessing what they're going to do. And you've Bayer, who's, you know, basically said the same thing. Um, that could be four pure play consumer health businesses, which in two years could be amazing from an M&A perspective. But like last year, they were all out of business. None of them were doing any deals. So you have those four out of business. You have Nestle bringing in a new CEO of Health Sciences. So they're out of business. You have Unilever with Smarty Pants. You've got P&G, who's got a much higher threshold for transacting. They're very interested, but like it's a very high threshold. So you have like the major acquirers of the last five years, Unilever and Nestle, out. You've got the other four kind of likely. You've got Reckitt, who's dealing with this Mead Johnson situation. Um, so if you're a VMS business, why would you go to sell your business in the last year? Like your, your entire strategic landscape is out of business. Um, and so that's the other thing is like you can control a lot and you should make sure that all of that binary stuff is managed. But you also want to make sure and timing is like things happen, like you can't control everything. But like if you know these things are going on, these dynamics, um, working around them, figuring out timing, again, to your point about optionality, like having the ability to say, OK, I'm going to sell my business now. Um, or I'm going to wait a year when all of these guys are back online is, is kind of critical as well. Yeah. I think people miss what you mentioned around a lot of the leadership change. I think that that, you know, obviously puts a little bit of a pause in, in kind of going, okay, they go through this large assessment of their business and they need to figure out where the gaps are. Exactly. And based on if it's, you know, need states, is it distribution? Is it what, wherever those things are at form factors or whatever they kind of deem as like important in terms of their new strategy, they have to first look at what they have and what can they maybe even fix internally before they're going to go out and buy something else. And then at that point, you've got a couple of years where that then looks a little bit more clear, a little bit more, you know, understanding of, okay, what's out there, what's good, what looks nice. And maybe even, you know, some of the macro stuff with interest rates or whatever, like you're, you're also trying to like compound some of that timing and look at it. And you're saying, okay, let's do that. Because to your point, there was, I would say, you know, 2020 ish, um, you know, and obviously that was like the craziness around just everybody seemed to want to buy like broad based or like anything they could buy that was giving them exposure to you know, supplements, health and wellness, whatever what they wanted it. They were just like, let me take whatever I can get. And they weren't necessarily thinking about maybe where this evolves to after people go back to normalcy or they start to maybe even evolve into their health and wellness journey. And they start to look at need states or look at, you know, health conditions, like where do they want to play at? So as a business, you know, I always love like the acquisition, something like a neutral or something like that, where they said, I love this thing and this thing's going to go super deep there. And I know that wherever I buy it at, and if I have conviction in this need state or whatever over the next 10, 15, 20 years, like I know I'm going to win on this one because that we're over trying to say, you know, not to say that the Bountiful company is a bad deal or not, but like there's so many things they're playing in. There's going to be some great things, some not so great things, right. and then maybe it'll all wash out at the end of the day. But the, the point is you don't really know you know, where that's going to go or what that's going to make sense. And you have to put so many resources internally to just manage the beast of how big that thing is right. anyway. So I think that the change is more towards what we had even mentioned at the beginning of the conversation is like consumers naturally are starting to target what they want to serve in their own needs. And that naturally creates, you know, arguably maybe not as big, massive businesses, but stronger, tighter knit, like maybe... $300 million revenue brands or $500 million revenue brands, instead of having like, you know, a brand that does multiple billions of dollars or something right. like that, like there maybe is a lot of really great brands. And then, you know, you kind of mentioned earlier, like that maybe creates the cycle in which those businesses look at, look at them earlier, because if they want to get the value out of them 
they're going to have to get them earlier than what they normally would wait for these businesses to get to. So maybe the cycle where they start to deal with, um, you know, with you guys, bankers or anything like that to try to get advice, like it should probably start a little bit earlier than where it is, because this isn't, we're not talking, I still think food and beverage has that unique retail and distribution model where like, if you want to be put into a Coke or a Pepsi, you have to be a certain size. It doesn't matter. Like you, you're going to get, uh, the fire's going to be put out if they they pour the gasoline on you if you're too small. That's not the same as if it's a Unilever or whatever that is. They can fit in smaller brands and make it make sense because they know they can. They have different, I guess, like mechanisms within their business that's that's useful and it's not so stringent like the I guess Cokes and Pepsis and and, and things like that. So I'm interested to see like where that evolves. And to your point, like these last couple of years have been I want to say like boring, but they haven't been as exciting as prior years because it seemed like every couple of weeks like there were the massive deals getting put out there and you're like holy crap like what is going on here like you know it, it didn't matter now it's like you have to be almost exceptional to a point where like people just can't see any other life without you like they have to have you that's the only yeah. like it's a it's a must have not a nice to have well, and that shows up in the financials. Like you mentioned Nutrafol. I mean, Nutrafol was a phenomenal business. Like they built, it was very skew focused. It didn't have a bunch of proliferation. Oh, your little guy's awake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's like, he's like, he's like, I heard you talking about me earlier and I want to, I want to yell. I'm going to, I'm going to wail. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Nutrafol was like, that's a good example of a business that was built really well and thoughtfully like it was very profitable it was growing nicely it had clear market fit it was they didn't have skew proliferation they had a good formula that was i don't know if it was like a but it was proprietary to them i don't know what else they had but um it was very clear to the consumer and you know what was a little unusual about neutral was that it was primarily a d2c business and so and its price point doesn't really lend it to traditional distribution um where Unilever has taken it, though, is with Amazon. And Amazon has, I don't know if it's doubled the business, but it's massively grown the business. And now that is a quite a large business. But to your point, you know, does it have multi-billion dollar potential, like some of these very diversified platforms? I don't know. It seems like a stretch. But it can be a very profitable, high growth um brand for Unilever for kind of the near, you know, nearer and longer term. And so I think, you know, you the point you made about like how these strategics look at scale of brands, I think it, it's very specific to the ones you're talking about. Um, you know, some of them are more comfortable with earlier businesses. Some of them are more comfortable with D2C only businesses. Some have a little bit more heartache around that. They just don't think they can go after smaller stuff. From our vantage point, once you get to like the $75 million LTM sales figure, you're kind of, you can go to everybody. Um, but below that, it's very much hit or miss. Some of them are interested. Some of them just won't be. Um, but that once you get to that $75 million plus have visibility into $100 million, like you, you can talk to everybody. Um, and that gives you a lot of flexibility as far as a process is concerned. Because all of a sudden, you're not limited purely by your size, but you have the ability to call kind of everybody. Um and, you know, and like we saw deals get, I mean, there were some deals that got done last year, but like, you know, you look at Atsuka's acquisition of Bonafide, right? That was a great outcome. Um, great deal. You look at, you talk to Atsuka about it. Part of their rationale was really Bonafide did this incredible distribution in through like the HPC channel. It was huge for them. And it was something that historically has not been interesting to strategics, but Atsuka has a big practitioner channel in Japan They've seen how effective that can be. And so for them, Bonafide was very, very strategic. But that that's sort of indicative of how M&A is working right now, is there there has to be something that makes it very strategic for the buyer, not just, oh, it's a nice brand with a good gummy vitamin that has like sugar that kids like, right? It's like, okay, what what does this do for me? How is it differentiated? Where do I see the growth coming from? How am I going to grow it? Um, is it profitable? You know, all of those things become very much part of the conversation and are, you know, and oftentimes fundamental to getting a deal done. This last part of the, I guess, content, I want to kind of talk about, I guess we started with some things that we were personally interested in, but I think I want to get a good sense of maybe 
professionally some spaces that you feel are going to be, I want to say like hotbeds, but like definitely we're going to hear at least a name or two that are going to pop up and we're going to see some patterns start to emerge in some spaces. I am thinking towards, you know, since you mentioned this category a few times in different ways, like, you know, women's health, I know that that in itself is is very broad. Um, I think about it maybe in how you can continue with um, multiple phases of, of women's health, I think is a, is a way to think about that. And, and that's not necessarily even for women's health, men's health as well. I think there's multiple phases of, of this and yeah. everybody at this point seems to be focused on maybe one, like, hey, menopause or fertility or whatever that is. But I think about it as how do you string together a few of them? Because then that 15 years or 20 years of a customer and you can meet them at different points. If you can build up the authority and, and have that, then it's going to be powerful. Now, it's a matter of, are there brands out there that can do that yet? I don't know. I would say that there's probably earlier cycle ones, maybe like younger women, maybe over the other side. It seems like the older side of the women's health seems to be like still focused on one particular phase. But that seems to be at least an area that it's getting, if it's investment dollars, or like you'd mentioned, a, a few different deals have kind of popped up that are interesting on that side. Yeah. I mean, women's health is like, and I've talked about this before, it's like one of the big conundrums right now, because there actually hasn't been that much money that's gone to it. Like you look at the businesses that are big, and they actually haven't raised that much money. Um, other than Ritual, which has raised a lot of money, you know, O Positive is kind of the best example. And there's really two. O Positive and Love Wellness are kind of the yeah. two leaders. O Positive has done it by doing exactly what you said, which they basically have these like sub brands that deal with different phases of the of a woman's life. So whether it's menopause, pregnancy, prenatal, and you know, like younger PMS type stuff. Um, so that's how they've approached going after the whole woman's life. And they originally were due to see an Amazon. They've now gone into target, um, and are doing so very kind of capitally efficiently. Uh, love wellness is another one. They're backed by encore. Um, they took a different approach, which was, they have the love wellness brand. Uh, they're definitely going after sort of, you know, younger millennial women, but again, they've been able to capture a large share of the market without sort of pigeonholing themselves as like a prenatal or a menopause business. Um, like I mentioned, I mean, Bonafide was very much menopause focused, but it had this practitioner channel, which was also very valuable. And it was a, a reasonably scaled business. But outside of that, you know, there's not a ton of businesses that have been able to scale. Um, which is really interesting because you think about what a priority this is. If you talk to any strategic, women's health is one of their top. It's like women's health, gut health, sleep. Like those are everybody's priorities. There's not a lot of creativity with this bunch. So like once one of them picks a couple of categories, they all follow along. Um, and they're all waiting to do something in women's health. And it'll be interesting to see, I think, over the next two to three years, like these businesses are getting to scale, you know, if you want to make a bet in women's health, you're not going to have a lot of options. Um, and, you know, so, so it's, it's very competitive. And then you have sort of everyone else who's like sub 50 million at this point. Um, and a lot of them, you know, needed parallel are doing phenomenally well, but they're very prenatal focused. Um, you have a bunch of smaller menopause businesses, some of which have sort like been successful, some have not. You have brands like Julie, which you know is going after Plan B and kind of taking more of that OTC approach, which is which is really interesting. Like the the emergency contraception space is very interesting, but it's one very small category. There's obviously a lot of other areas. So you know it'll be it'll be interesting to see how it evolves, how you know money gets deployed into those um, segments, and then which strategics are able to make plays there um you know it's it's kind of wild that it's like only now occurring to them that women's health should be important but like <laughs> it is what it is um the other thing that's kind of interesting is like women over index in certain areas with so certain issues and people haven't necessarily thought about products that way but you take the like hemorrhoids and things like that the other thing that'll be interesting is how brands think about marketing to women for things that historically like may exist on the shelf, especially in the OTC space, but have not necessarily been marketed well to women. And that becomes really more of an education play. So I'll be curious to see like, as opposed to just going after like the menopause supplements or whatever it is, like, are there really symptom specific 
products that are available or maybe, you know, not well, but are available um, where women actually over index, like meaningfully, like, you know, way more than men do in terms of their experience with those issues, but just haven't been educated about it. So I think, you know, we'll see what happens, but it's a really interesting space to follow. Yeah, I think about just kind of what you're mentioning too around, you know, the communication strategy or like how you, you know, take something that is old and dusty and you kind of repackage it in a way that makes more sense to whatever. And I I think about this in a different way, even with some of the stuff that's like with GLP-1, where there's the natural kind of like second order, like even third order effects that will happen or are already starting to happen on the more like nutritional ingredient side or just even proteins or amino acids or any of these kind of like gut health or whatever. It's like these products have already existed for a long period of time. They're going to be like repackaged in a way that's you know, geared towards weight management or, or whatever that is. And then, you know, that in itself probably doesn't make a clear winner. I think there's also some things that need to be added onto that to make it probably more interesting, like we had mentioned before. But I do think like that will naturally create some new winners and losers based on just, you know, the, the huge amount of people that are going to be taking these yeah. medications or, you know, it's just I mean, it's- the, the reality is, is like, it seems like it's, like suck the air out of the room, but it's still not even anywhere close to how many people could potentially be taking it. And from what I've at least seen from, you know, anecdotal type stuff, but also just like the consumer surveys and all this kind of stuff is like fundamental change in day-to-day life. It's, it's completely different. So then that creates so many behavioral shifts that you have to be positioned in that to make sense. And maybe you could be on the wrong side of it, which I think a lot of these legacy brands, unfortunately, will be uh, yeah. on the other side of it and are the ones that are going to be smart enough to go like, Oh, we need to move here because this is going to be extremely important. Uh, and it's, I don't know, it just depends on how people believe long-term on this, but I, I'm like, I want to say like, I'm super bullish, but I just see, you know, the obesity part of the consumer health space. Like that is our biggest problem, arguably that creates so much trickle down of, of, uh, help across a lot of these other kind of nutrition based diseases or whatever. It's so like, that's going to be solved or at least solvable. And then it's a matter of like from CPG or whatever, like how do they get to this new reality? How do they figure out ways to leverage it? Yeah. I mean, like it's, it's transformational, like just anecdotally, the number of people I know who are taking some form of GLP one, whether it's like the branded products or doing like the peptides on their own like it's shocking. I was at a, a party on Saturday and like I met like three people within 10 minutes who were all on JLP ones. And like they all looked fine. Like there was not it was it was clearly not a doctor prescribed situation. Um but it's it fun you're right. It fundamentally changes the way that your your life looks. And so, you know, we've talked to companies like I, I know one founder who's launching a product this fall at Walmart and you know, one of his learnings, because he he went through, I think he was like on Ozempic or something, I don't know, he was doing something. And his learnings were that, you know, Vitamin Shop and others have basically put walls in and they're like, this is for the GLP-1 products. But the problem is, if you're not hungry, you don't want to take 15 pills. So like, that's a bad solution. Um, and you also, you know, the onus of education is yes on the consumer, but that's not a good way to market to the consumer. And so making it easy for someone who's going through this like fundamental change, instead of taking 15 products and like do your own research and suffer through the 80 pills you have to take, let me give you one product that addresses the fact that you're going to need to figure out how to get more protein into your system. Um, you know, aminos, things like that. Um just like, you know, fiber becomes really important. Like there's all these different things that become critical as you're doing this and figuring it out, like out how to put that into a single product solution. Maybe it's not a single product, but that's very simple. Uh, to me, it seems like such an obvious thing. Um, people are starting to do it, but it's, again, it's been very like haphazard of, of what Vitamin Shop did, which is they just pulled a bunch of legacy brands stuck them on a wall and we're like, this is our GLP one wall. Um, so I, I, a hundred percent agree with you. I think like, you know, it's funny. I've also more and more women now are taking creatine, which like 10 years ago, I only think the like muscly guys in my office <laughs> and like, 
<laughs> like it was just something that it never even occurred. And now, you know, with all the research around women and muscles and pro- how important protein is and, and like really building that muscle. Um, and again, like with GLP ones, it becomes even more of a topic because a lot of the times you'll lose muscle. So like, how do you maintain your muscle? Um, but I, I think it's it's really interesting to look at, and it's not just looking at like the necessarily the target audience, but just across the board, how is this going to impact how consumers approach wellness, and how does it impact their? I mean, there's the whole food conversation, which I think is far more complex than I won't get into, but certainly on the supplement side, it's you know, it's and I'm also seeing things like the natural ozempic, which I have questions about. Um, <laughs> And like the telehealth side, I mean, Hims had a kind of tough report recently, but like they've gone into GLP ones, Rose gone into GLP ones. Like these are, these are big, big markets. It's a lot of people that are going to be impacted across multiple demographics, you know, across the country. So we're not talking about like the New York, LA crowd. We're talking about everybody. So I, I think it's fascinating. I think the strategics will have to pay attention, especially as products launch into it, in terms of being able to market to that group of people. I think this conversation was fascinating, <laughs> and I want to be, uh, you know, definitely courteous of both of our schedules because I, I know your son felt that way. But I'm glad oh, he was he, you know, trust me, he is constantly listening, and he is already ready to like be put on as like a junior associate of like a due diligence report, he's already ready to bill out. He's already, he's, he's ready. Perfect. Good for you. Yeah. 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 Well, Teddy, I appreciate the time and and everything. This was definitely great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. I uh, love talking to you as always and um, look forward to doing more of these in the future. I hope you enjoyed this YouTube video. If you did, consider hitting that like button to support me. Also help me get to my new short-term goal of 4,000 subscribers by hitting that subscribe button. I'd love to see you join me on this journey, but we need to fix the fact that slightly more than 90% of you that are watching this YouTube video right now are not subscribed to my channel, and that makes me extremely sad. But I do want to thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you on the next one.